Okay, so you see uh, that we are starting the divergence and the divergence theorem. Um, so we're kind of going to put a pause in studying Stokes' theorem. We spent like a good week on that, as we know it's very important. But before I move on to this divergence and divergence theorem, I'd like to uh, um, sort of say why we call Stokes' theorem a fundamental theorem of calculus. So I'm just going to put a, so why is Stokes' theorem categorized or classified as a fundamental theorem of calculus? You'll see calculus. You'll see this appear um, in your textbook or, or on on other people's lecture series that Stokes' theorem is a fundamental theorem of calculus. To understand why, I'll I'll remind you what the actual. We have to go back to the one D version. What do we learn when we were, you know, mere children in in calculus in one hundred and one? Well, the fundamental theorem of calculus for one dimensional calculus said something like the following: If you have a function f of x and then you decide to take its derivative, you get a new function. But then you could go ahead and integrate that, that new function, and you've got this thing. And what the fundamental theorem of calculus says is that this is basically the same thing as what you started out with. If you take a derivative and then integrate, you get the, the same thing you started out with back. OK, and why? You have to add a constant or something like this. But morally, the idea is that an integral and the derivative sort of undo each other. And to really drive the point home, if you look on the left-hand side of my equality, if you look at how many derivatives I have, number of derivatives, you'll see, okay, you've got one. And on and how many integrals do I have on the left? I have one integral. Number of integrals is one. If you look on the right-hand side, you see you've got zero derivatives and zero integrals. And so another way to say all this is that a conserved quantity is the number of integrals minus the number of derivatives is the same on both sides. You got one minus one is the same thing as zero minus zero on both sides. Okay, so why does this, um, how does this tie back into Stokes' theorem? So I'll resize this. So I'll just briefly restate Stokes' theorem. It says something like the double integral of curl of a vector field dotted it with the outward normal over some surface is equal to a single integral of the of the circulation. Okay, so let's look at the right hand side. How many integrals do we have? Uh, I see, I'll use my highlighter. We have one integral, two integrals. So you've got two over here. On the right, my number of integrals is just one. Now it's a little harder to see. We don't see that curl doesn't have uh, a derivative immediately staring at you in the face. But if you remember the definition of curl, it involves many single partial derivatives. So in curl is secretly hiding a single derivative. So we've got the number of integrals, oh, sorry, the number of derivatives on the left is, a, is one, but I'm not seeing any derivatives of v on the left. So on the left, I have the number of derivatives is equal to zero. And if you do the same difference, it's the same on both sides. Two integrals minus one derivative is one, and one integral minus zero derivatives is also one. So this is why this is why this is considered a fundamental theorem of calculus, because it's saying that even in higher dimensions, in in multi-dimensional geometry, you still get the you still get these sort of facts that um, derivatives and integrals cancel each other out. So I thought uh, I at least owed that def that discussion to you all of why <clears throat> of why we categorize the Stokes theorem as a fundamental theorem of calculus. So we're going to switch gears and we're going to start talking about divergence, which is going to be a different kind of derivative of vector fields um, than curl was, and we're going to learn of a different kind of fundamental theorem of calculus. So I'm going to move on to the next page. I'll have the chat open in case anybody needs, uh, where's the chat? There we go. Okay. People need me to stop. They can feel free to use that chat. 
Okay, so now we're on page two. Let me introduce the notion of divergence of a vector field. And you want to read about this in your textbook. This is 6.5. Okay. <clears throat> so let me just remind you when we started doing vector fields a couple of weeks ago, we had our two favorite, we had our rotational vector field, which was a negative y comma x. This was a oops, this was rotational vector field, whereas we had a this radially expanding vector field over here. This was I think x comma y. Ah, that looks like a y. X comma y. This is our sort of radial vector field, and we spent a lot of time working with the curl. Remember, so that we found that the curl over here was equal to I think two, but here the curl was equal to zero. That's because curl is sort of measuring how much your vectors are rotating in, in some, to some degree. So now we're going to learn about divergence and we'll see that this over here is a vector field that has positive divergence, but this vector field right here does not. So let me, it's sort of going to be describing how much the vector field is expanding, which is like a different property than its rotation. So let me actually give you the definition. So given a vector field v, which is p comma q, or you could be doing this in three dimensions, and that would be p q r. We can define the vector, the def, the divergence of v is okay. It's it's written div of v, and it's a sum of partial derivatives. So it's partial p, partial x, plus partial q, partial y. That's in the 2D case. In the 3D case, it's not that bad. It's partial p, partial x, partial q, partial y, plus partial r, partial z. Oops. So you see that the 3D case, it's not, it's not as horrible as the as the vector field, sorry, as the definition of the curl of a 3D vector field. Divergence is much nicer. It's not, it's not as wild as what happens with the curl. And it's, it's always a scalar function. And if this looks like an arbitrary formula for you right now on your page, um, a kind of a, a, handy way, a handy way to remember this is it's kind of like the divergence of V is sort of like taking the operator partial, partial x, partial, partial y, and dotting it with p comma q. It's sort of like dotting this, this operator here with your vector field v. Um, and the same thing goes for the 3D case. <clears throat> if this, if this, this might be a handy way to help you remember the formula. At least that's how I do it. But it's kind of an abusive notation because that's not a vector field. That's, those are operators. That's like um, differentiating differential operators in the two components, but it helps in terms of um, storing things out in your brain. So let's do an actual example. Let's compute the curl of these two vector fields up top. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna lasso this and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna copy that. And we're gonna move to the next, next page so I'll have the same formula on the next page. So, I'm keeping my eye up on the chat if anybody needs me to go back. But let me copy the, the formula. Okay. Oh, took more than we wanted. There we go. So that's the formula for a divergence of a 2D function, of a 2D vector field. So let's compute the divergence of our radial vector field, x comma y. Okay. That was, oops, sorry. That was our blue vector field on the previous page. So let me, that was this thing right here. Okay, so to, this isn't too bad. <clears throat> well, to compute the divergence, it's going to be, this is my P and I got to hit a, uh, an X derivative on that P and I need to hit a Y derivative on that Q. So this is going to be partial X, partial X, plus partial Y, partial Y, we see that is one plus one equals to two. So that is a positive number. And how that's um, manifest in the picture to the right is the fact that the blue vectors are sort of spreading out. 
So positive divergence is telling us <clears throat> the vector field is spreading out. Okay, let's do another example. Let's do that green vector field. Okay, so let us do divergence of our rotational one, which was negative y comma x. So this is my p, this is my q. I'll draw the picture again for you. It rotates. Okay, and let's compute the, the divergence of this thing. So if I compute the divergence, I'll do partial negative y, this as my p, partial x, and plus partial x, partial y. But now you see the things have flipped. My variables are in different spots and I'm taking the different things. So uh, this is just zero and this is zero and the sum of zero is zero. So this right here has zero divergence. And the reason why is because, um, you know, if you sort of, this is how, this is how I think about divergence. This is how I sort of sort, sort it out in my brain. I pretend that I'm looking above onto, say, the surface of an ocean. And the vectors are the sort of, they're describing how the water's moving when viewed from above. And let's say I throw a net, like a small, a small net. I'll even draw it. I'll draw it in. Uh, purple. So say I throw a little square net onto my surface, onto the surface of the water, and I let the water carry the net as it moves around. You can see how it would move. So in this case, my net would be moving along the surface, but it's just kind of rotating. The net wouldn't get pulled or stretched. The, the area of the net wouldn't expand as it moves through the water. And that's, that's because the vector field has zero divergence. Whereas in the picture up top in the blue vector field, if I dropped a little net, it would move out and maybe after a couple minutes, it might start look to look like a really stretched out net. And so because the, because the area of the net is expanding as it's moving through the flow of the water, that's, that's, that's manifest in the fact that we have positive divergence. Okay. Okay. And let me do, let me explain here. You know, I think I can minimize this so I can kind of keep it all on one page. I'm really liking this minimize feature. So let me re sort of minimize this so I can keep doing examples. I also want to show you uh, an example of a, of the divergence of a vector field of, of three components. So let's do the divergence. The divergence of uh, the following three vector, uh, 3D vector field, x comma y comma z. Now we know that this is the 3D analog of my blue picture up here. I've just tacked on a z component in my z, <clears throat> a, 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 z uh, a z variable in my z component. That's what I've done. So if I want to draw this vector field, it's in 3D space. That's my coordinate axes. And I'll draw it in blue so I can kind of keep consistency. This is that radially extending vector field. It's like a firework and every point it's coming away from that centermost origin. So kind of what we were saying before, this also looks like it will exhibit some sort of expansion as you, if you had some sort of analog of a three-dimensional net and that, that net was pushed as it moves in 3D space, it would, it would also be expanding. So let's actually compute the divergence of this. Well, <clears throat> I'll write it all out. It's, it's partial P partial X plus partial Q partial Y plus partial Z uh, partial R partial Z. And okay, we, that's, that's my P, that's my Q, that's my R. So we're looking at partial X partial X, partial Y partial Y, partial Z partial Z, <clears throat> which is one plus one plus one. And that's three and that's greater than zero. So this has positive divergence. And this sort of agrees with what I was saying. We had expected, you know, given, given that divergence is something that measures expansion, then we look at this ahead of time, this blue vector field, and we think, oh, it probably is exhibiting positive divergence. And then we compute it, and we see that it's, it's three, it's positive.
Now, I don't expect people in this class, I mean, I can't expect myself to do this, to distinguish between what a vector field with three uh, divergence as, or it looks like, or a vector field with two divergence, <clears throat> but it is important to be able to distinguish between like positive divergence, negative divergence, and zero divergence. So the three, it's not so important that it's three, it's more important that it's a positive number. Okay, all right. Um, but in all these examples I've done so far, I'll highlight our computation. Here we got two, here we got zero, and here we got three. Now all those numbers are just constant numbers. Those aren't functions, but that doesn't always have to happen. So let me, I'm gonna start a new page and show you if I cook up a different vector field, it's possible to get a, a non-constant divergence. So let's do another example. <clears throat> v of x, y, is just gonna be x squared comma zero. So if I wanted to plot this thing out, um, the zero in the y component means none of my vectors have vertical displacement. They're all gonna be horizontal vectors. <clears throat> and the, I mean, x squared is always positive. So the, ver the, the horizontal vectors are always pointing to the right. So in fact, the vectors get bigger magnitude when we go further away from that vertical line. So they're always looking like this, but as we get farther away, they get much bigger. So let's compute the divergence of this thing. Okay, I've got to hit the first component with an x derivative. So if I do that, I get 2x plus the second component with a y derivative, and that's zero. So here, our divergence is 2x. It's a function of x and technically y, but really it's just a function of, of x. And what can we make, how can we make sense of this picture? Well, if we look, I'm going to highlight, if we look to the right of that vertical line, we're seeing that 2x, that 2x, which is the divergence, is positive here. And that's sort of reflected in the fact that you see expansion. I mean, you know, a net would start to sort of stretch out as you, you know, the, the right side of the net's going to start speeding up really fast and the, the net has to compensate by stretching out. Whereas on the left-hand side, we have that the function 2x is negative here. And that's... Your, the reason why we see negative, how, sorry, the reason that we have negative divergence on this side is that if you threw a net down, it would start to get compressed. The left side would start slamming into the right side and um, it would sort of get, you, the area would be decreasing. So you're seeing negative divergence. Negative divergence. And here's positive divergence. Okay. And, we're doing pretty well on time. Okay, and I have one more example. I don't have an I don't have an explicit formula for this next vector field, but we can sort of see. Um, we can sort of use. We can eyeball it. Okay, so. So here's an example. Consider this vector field. Okay, so I'm going to plot two little points, and I'm going to draw some arrows. I think I'll use green. Okay, so we're going to see some sort of propagation away from this point over here. And then the vectors start trying to move over to the right. And they're all doing it in a super flat way. At this point in the middle, they're sort of all flat vectors. But then they start to come in towards this point here. Okay, so I'm going to divide this up into three regions with my highlighter. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call this sort of a blue region. This will be my yellow region. And what's between yellow and blue, that is green, in this region. So just kind of how I've drawn things. Okay, Nicola, okay. Um, I'll read Nicola's question in just a sec. I just wanna say that if, I don't have a formula for this, but if we did actually have a formula for the vector field and we computed the divergence, we would probably be seeing, um, we would be seeing positive divergence here. We would probably be seeing negative divergence 
on in that blue region, and we'd be probably seeing zero divergence in the green middle strip. Okay, so we have a question, can we also think of negative divergence as moving towards the origin and positive divergence as moving away? Yeah, yeah. But so Nicola, the, the answer to your question is yes, um, but don't restrict yourself to th think that you need to be moving in towards something radially to have negative divergence. Because, I mean, look at this picture. And the picture up top, we had, you know, technically the the purple vectors aren't all emanating in towards an, an, a single point or a single origin, but we are exper experiencing negative divergence. So I wanna say, yeah, but don't let that sort of restrict your um, understanding, because just be able to understand that this has negative divergence. Okay, okay, cool. So I think, as you can see, the di divergence is actually a lot nicer, at least in my opinion, than curl, especially 3D curl, because we just, we know by now that takes a whole bunch of time. Um, so divergence is kind of nicer to compute than um, curl. So I want to state the divergence theorem for you, because this is going to go back to all of our flux and surface integrals that we've been doing so far. Okay, so I'm going to flip the page. Okay, so we have all the tools we need to start the divergence theorem. Which is a really exciting theorem. It's a really beautiful one. Okay, sometimes you will see this written as Gauss's theorem. They mean the same thing. Okay. So here's the, here's the statement. <clears throat> Let V of X, Y, Z be a vector field in 3D space. Okay, we have already examples in our head of what this could look like. You know, think of that green vector field I did over here, or the blue one, I suppose. Okay, sorry for the whiplash. Um, and we're going to make sure it's defined on some solid region omega. So uh, defined on some solid, solid region omega. So we have practice, we have so much practice with dealing with those sorts of omegas. We know how to integrate over those things. So in your head right now, omega could be the inside of a sphere, it could be the inside of a cone, a cylinder, a box, a rectangle, a cube, a triangular prism. I mean, it's just endless what these solid regions can, can look like. And we've all had so much practice working with those. Okay, so now there's more to the theorem. So let the 2D boundary surface be denoted S. <clears throat> Okay, and let N be the outward, okay, be the outward unit normal vectored. Okay, so let me draw a quick little sketch. So um, here might be some oobly goobly region omega. So think of it as a 3D thing. This is 3D, it's, this is omega, it's, and its boundary, its shell is S. So um, it's, it's kind of, it's really hard to draw, but you've got to believe me, like the inside, the blue is like the pulp part of the fruit, and the green is like the, like the skin of the fruit. So I'm not going to draw it everywhere, but S is really just the edge, okay? But the, but is over the full thing, okay, I can do it. Okay, so S is... Um, so S is a two-dimensional surface, so we could, that's something we parameterize. And, you know, any orientable surface, it has two choices of a orientation for the normal vector. Either it can be pointing out or in, and we're saying in this case, our N is pointing outwards. So that's N. Okay, so here is what the theorem finally says. Um, so then, we have an equality of integrals. So the double integral the flux, so v dot n dA over the surface is equal to the triple integral over the region of the divergence of v dV. Okay, so let me put that in my special 
Yes, okay. Okay, so what is this saying? The thing on the left, the thing on the left right here, this is telling you how much the vector field is flowing through that surface. Okay, so um, the picture is going to get kind of messy, but let me draw it in, in green, where we have some ambient vector field V outside, and it's coming in and through my green surface. Okay, and I'm sorry that the picture is so messy, but that's, that's my V. And the, the quantity on the left measures, okay, how much V is flowing through the surface. All right, now the thing on the right-hand side is the double integral of how much, how much the vector field is spreading out on the inside. This is telling us uh, the, uh, like the aggregate spread of the vector field occurring on the inside of S or just, you know, IE on omega, on the solid part. So here's like another way to, that this could make sense. Here's, here's the way that I've always explained it or thought of it to myself. So imagine, I really like this, this net example. So imagine you're like a scuba diver and you put some net in underneath the ocean. So you're, you're in the ocean and you've got, let's say your net is kind of weird. It, it's like, a, it's actually like the surface of a sphere. And you want to know how many little minnows are flowing through the net. So if it's the case that, so let me draw this, I'll, I, I can draw it. So imagine this is your little net. And imagine that you get positive flux, meaning on, on, on average, you notice that minnows are coming, there are more minnows coming out of your sphere than there are minnows coming into your sphere. So the only way that could happen is if uh, like the minnows are reproducing on the inside of the sphere. That's kind of what the divergence theorem was telling you, that more minnows are, are being created than are dying on the inside. And, that, and that's a justification for why you're seeing more come out from the center, because there's no way that could happen unless there was some um, expansion of the number of minnows happening from within. So that's, that's kind of... That's kind of like the most intuitive way I could make this, uh, this theorem. So that's, that's the theorem. And I'll have you note one important part that V needs to be defined on the solid region. So again, it's one of those situations where if V has a singularity, it better not be happening on the solid region. <clears throat> okay. Okay, thank you, thank, you for, uh, thank you for showing up and uh, take care. Okay. Okay, so for the rest of the class, we'll be doing a few examples. Okay. All right, let's do this. I'm gonna move to this next page. I guess I can copy and paste this. That's the statement of the theorem. So let's paste, okay. Here we've got page six, page six, that's right. All right, so let's do our first example. And uh, let me say another thing, let me say one more, one more thing about the theorem that's nice, is that notice that this thing by now, you know, we've had lots of practice with doing flux integrals. They're hard, they're difficult, because what you need to do is, well, A, you need to parameterize the surface, okay? That's, that's difficult in and of itself. Then you need to take the partial derivatives, the partial u and the partial v, okay? If, you, if I were in person right now, you'd see me holding up my fingers. So I'm on the, that's the second thing you need to do. The third thing you need to do is take the cross product of, u, of partial u and partial v. Then the fourth thing is you need to take the dot product of that with the v, and then you need to integrate the thing. So this is a lot of work. And this theorem should be helpful for you, or at least a relief, because it's telling you two different ways to compute the same number. So if you really don't want to do this integral on the left, if you don't want to do all the work, you can try to see if you can change it into a triple integral and see if it's actually easier there. Okay, so that's another plug for why you want to, why the divergence theorem can like save your life. So let's do a really nice little example. So let's do 
of the vector field V is one comma one comma one. Okay, so we know in 3D space, this looks like um, the vectors are just coming out like this. If you're, if you're a scuba diver, that just means the minnows are really going in straight lines. And uh, okay, you can see that the divergence of V is going to be zero. That's, you know, it's the divergence is a sort of a derivative of a vector field and a constant vector field will have zero divergence. Um, okay, um, so let's let, okay, what am I going to say? I'm going to say S is the unit sphere centered at origin and omega is the solid re is the solid contained by s so uh, omega is a ball that's what ma mathematicians distinguish spheres and balls because spheres are just the two dimensional surface but balls are the the three dimensional solid region bounded by a sphere okay okay and so if so what the divergence theorem is telling us says that, oh, I should tell you what n is. n is outward normal. Okay, I'll draw the three colors, okay. So I've got, oh no, I think I did it in green. I think the surface was light green, was dark green. So here's s with n, so there's s, n, and the inside stuff is omega. And the divergence theorem tells us that if you want to know the flux of v dot n over my sphere dA, that's the same thing as the triple integral over omega of the divergence of this constant vector field dV, but the divergence is zero, so this thing is just zero. So the, di the divergence theorem says that this flux integral is completely zero, which is Great, we never, had, we never had to parameterize a single thing. But maybe we already could have seen that ahead of time because let me, let me try to convince you why this, why this flux integral would probably give us zero anyway. Um, but here's another reason for why we expect the flux integral to be zero. I can sort of decompose S into two hemispheres. All right, S1 plus S2. And let me draw that out real quick. So, so maybe this is going to be, this is S1, and this right here is S2. Okay, so I've, I've kind of cut it along a, a certain plane. They're not, they're not like top and bottom hemispheres. Um, and I'll draw, I'll draw the normal vector field. So here's n, here's n, and let me draw the vector fields, the vector v. So there's v, and at every single point, you see kind of what is happening. What I'll use my highlighter. Everything, every for every acute angle on this on S1, there's an obtuse angle of the same, like uh, a comparable obtuse angle on the bottom. Oops, now I want to do this. And so for that reason, the, the flux integral over S1 is the negative of the flux integral over S2. So the, the flux of V dot N over S1 is equal to the negative uh, S2 flux integral. Okay, and so if you add these things up, that means that the flux integral over S1 plus the flux integral over S2 is zero but the flux integral of those two pieces is just the flux integral over S, where I've kind of, I kind of stopped drop it. I stopped writing the same integrand, but this is like another reason that you could see why the flux integral would be zero in the first place. So two, two ways to see the same thing. Basically the idea is however many fish are flowing out, the same number of fish are flowing in. And that's the same thing as saying that um, there is on average, the same number of fish dying and reproducing on the inside of your net. So that's what that's just another way to get at the divergence theorem. So let's do another example. Oops. Okay. All right. Doing really well on time. Okay. So 
I'm going to move to this next page. Um, I think I still have this top thing copied, so I'll just replace that. Okay. Okay, just keeping that divergence theorem everywhere we go. Saying the flux on the outside is the divergence on the inside. So now we're on page seven. And let us look. So let's do new example. Um, v is that radial vector field. So x, y, z. Okay, and then uh, s is the cube centered at origin with vertices at plus or minus one, plus or minus one, and plus or minus one. So let me just draw this out for you. We've got our coordinate axes, x, y, z. We know the vector field is that radial extending one, radially extending one, that's v. Oh, I'm, I'll use a different color for s. I'll use, I'll use red. So now, the, oops, the cube is like this thing, it has eight, uh, eight vertices all at the plus one. So like this is one, one, one. This is negative one, negative one, negative one. That's my S. Okay, and I'm gonna use my normal vector field is my, at, at N is at every face the outward N. So sort of piecewise, it's flat, but piecewise. So that's, that's the flux. So what we'll wanna do is I'll want to compute, what we'll do is one, let's compute the double integral, the flux v dot n over the surface s dA. Let's do this by hand. And then at the end, we'll compute the, the triple integral of the divergence over the inside, and we'll see that we get the same number. Okay, so uh, like at first, this might look like a menacing task. Why? Not only do, are we doing a flux integral by hand, but we, we're gonna to need to do it in six pieces because there are six different faces. Your left face, right face, top face, bottom face, front face, back face. Okay, but there's enough symmetry in here that if we do it for one, we've kind of done it for all. So I'll, I'll discuss this slowly. So let's just, for right now, let's look at the far uh, right face. So I'm gonna call that particular one, that particular face S1. So I know S really is decomposed into six faces. You have S1 plus, okay, I don't know, maybe the left one is gonna be S2, maybe plus S3. I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you what these other, well, right? Plus S4, plus S5, plus S6. But let's just register our attention right now for, to, onto S1. On S1, the normal vector here is the thing that points directly out to the right. So the normal vector is zero, zero, one. Also what is happening on S1 is our X, the, our, our Y and our Z are coordinates that move around, but our X is fixed on that one slice. And there our X is fixed at one. Okay. So let's write out what is the double integral? What is the flux integral? over S1 dA. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna rewrite some of the stuff on the interior. So on the interior, I'm looking at the double integral over, okay, well V I said is X, Y, Z, dotted with, and I know for this particular S1, my normal vector is zero, zero, one. And we're doing a dA integral. And I can just tell you, oh, Sorry, thank you, yes, 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 oops, oops, I'm so sorry, everybody. It's not zero, zero, one, n is one, zero, zero, and I was just about to notice that because I noticed that that dot product would have been bad. Okay, sorry, okay. So let me tell you, if people didn't see you, what I did wrong, I said that the normal vector field, incorrectly, the normal vector field should be one, zero, zero. Okay, and the reason why is I'll actually, I'll do it in, um, I'll really make it bold over here. I'll actually zoom in that it's really this vector, which we know that should be one, zero, zero. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So, so that, that, this was N, this was V. And if I actually do that double integral, 
I'm looking at the, in, the double integral of the function x over my s1. Okay, but also I let me highlight what I, I made an observation previously. Over that surface, I know x is just going to be constant one. So this is the double integral of over s1 of the constant function one dA, and that gives me we know that is just the surface area of S1. And I know S1 is just this little square of side length two by two. So I can actually just tell you that this thing is four. So what I've learned is that the contribution of the flux from that leftmost piece is actually only worth four. And we, this is kind of an amazing thing that we were able to do because we didn't actually have to parameterize anything because the numbers kind of work, were so rigid and they worked out so nicely. So we found that the flux contribution on, on the rightmost piece is four. And you can convince yourself that th basically if you, you could do this on your own, you could do this for every single face, but there's so much symmetry that every single face is going to work out the same way even on the negative sides, because on the negative sides, you'll have like negative one times negative X, and then it'll all work out. So in fact, the flux over each, each side is equal to four. So thus, okay, thus the, the flux over the full surface is going to be well, how many faces do we have? We have six faces, so six copies of four, which is 24. Okay, so let's put a pin in that. We computed the flux over the cube. Now let's compute the right-hand side of what the divergence theorem tells us, and let's see if we get the same thing. So fingers crossed that we get the same thing. We know that, so number two, we're going to compute the triple integral of the divergence of v dv, so different v's, but that's okay. One means the vector field, one means volume, over omega, where omega is the solid region on the inside. Okay, this isn't too bad. This is actually going to be way easier because we've already computed that the divergence of v is positive 3. So we're really looking at the triple integral of 3 dv over omega. But this is just 3 times the volume of omega. And let me just, let me resize this so I have some more room. Now omega is a cube. Omega is a cube of each side length 2. So a, Q, a cube, like a, a rectangular prism of side lengths a, b, c is, has volume a times b times c. So the volume of the cube is going to be 2 times 2 times 2. That's 8. So now we've got 3 times 8. Lo and behold, that's 24. And I'll show you. That's the number we got previously. So yes, the numbers equal and are equal. And that's not an accident. This is not an accident. This is divergence theorem in action. OK. Yeah, it might be a nice activity. I mean, if you're looking for something to do to actually do one other, like a different one of these surfaces, one of the negative surfaces, and actually see why you do get positive four on the other ones. Okay. Um. <laughs> so I only only have I only have about four minutes left. So I just want to I I have to make a decision right now. Okay. So. Okay, I don't think there's enough time to do a full example, but I want to say that remember in Stokes' theorem, when we did Stokes' theorem, in order, in order for us to be able to set the thing up, we had to make sure that the boundary of C really agreed with the, with the orientation of, of S with the normal vector field. This is we spent like 25 minutes of this on, um, of this on Friday, and we really wanted to make sure orientations agree. So the analog of what's happening here is before you set up divergence theorem, you better, you better be making sure that the normal vector field is the vector, you're using the end that's pointing away and out of the inside. 
Otherwise, if you don't have that, you have to pay for it with a negative sign. So, so let me just say, so, so I mean, if S is some closed surface, so a closed surface here means no edge, no edges. So like the sphere works, but a hemisphere doesn't because a hemisphere has a circular edge. Okay, if S is some closed surface and N is the inward pointing normal, then um, I'm gonna say you have N in and N out and they're related by a negative sign. So N in is negative N out. And so if you want to do the flux of some V dot N using the inwards over your surface S, that's just gonna be the negative of S V dot N out DA. And then you can say that this thing by the divergence theorem is equal to the dot, is equal to the divergence. So after this stage is when you say, and this is the negative triple integral of the divergence, uh, d divergence of v dv. And so, like, like you can only make this step, you can only make that jump when the orientations are agreeing. So if you're not agreeing, just pay for it with a negative sign right there. Okay. Um, well, I don't think I have enough time to do any any of these examples, but so I guess we can wrap up for the day. Uh, and I guess I'll say that um, divergence theorem is pretty much everything we're going to be doing uh, for the rest of the week and sort of applications of this stuff. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm going to turn off the uh, recording.